Longhorn Nation with a week left to go in spring ball. Who are winning the major position battles on this Texas football team? You are Locked On Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. On today's episode of Locked on Longhorns, we're discussing the Texas football team and spring practices. Who are winning the major position battles heading into the orange and white game on April 15th? Then we're talking about Texas basketball. If Dylan DeSue does indeed return, what would that mean for Rodney Terry and this roster? And last but not least, the Texas baseball team lost a weekend series to Oklahoma State, but did get back on track against Air Force last night, winning that game 7-1. to one. Now they have a weekend series against Kansas State in Big 12 Conference play in the dish. So we discuss all of that and more on today's episode of Locked On Longhorns, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Before we get into the Texas football team, spring practices, uh, position battles, all of that jazz. We got to circle back to Major League Baseball. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see I got the old school Pirates hat on, the Roberto Clemente. And I came out here on Monday's episode, my last episode, and rightfully so, I showed a lot of praise to my Texas Rangers, who were undefeated at the time, had just swept the defending NL champion, Philadelphia Phillies. And I was really excited. So I came out here to give them flowers that they deserved. And since then, God has told me to be humble because they've lost two in a row to the Baltimore Orioles. So I will not mention the Texas Rangers on this podcast until they, A, look like legitimate contenders, or B, win five straight games, however long that takes. Now, I will say there were some Astros fans who laughed at me on Monday's episode, right? All the Rangers won't win 76 games this year. All the Rangers won't last till May. All the Rangers fans are already drinking the Kool-Aid. A whole bunch of laughing emojis. So I look up, and the Astros are on the verge of – Getting swept by the Detroit Tigers? So, you know, God instructed me to be humble, but he don't play about me either. So, Astros fans, y'all need to get it together. <laughs> you know, I'll hit y'all with that Caleb Clark and that Angel Reese. <laughs> the Detroit Tigers? <laughs> All right, let's talk about this Texas football team and the spring practices and the position battles. And position battles come from having really good talent and depth on your roster, right? You can't have great position battles without great players coming off the bench. And that's what this Texas football team has at really almost every position. They are loaded with talent. And let's start with the first position battle, which is quarterback or quarterback two. We knew that quarterback one would be locked in with Quinn Ewers returning this season. And although the media right tried to make it a quarterback battle with Arch Manning, especially when he started off quarterback two, we knew all along that Quinn Ewers was the unquestioned starter going into the season this year. I got one of my coworkers. He called me the other day while we're at work. He's like, hey, who's our starting quarterback this season? I said, Quinn Ewers. And he was like, do you think he'll be our starting quarterback by midseason? I said, yes, Isaac. He will be our starting quarterback throughout the the whole season unless he gets hurt, right? This Arch Manning propaganda has reached new levels, right? But we thought there may be a quarterback battle for quarterback two, right? Position battle for quarterback two. And that got really interesting when Arch Manning, slid right into that quarterback two role because Malik Murphy missed the first three spring practices. Now they came back from spring break and Malik slid right back into that quarterback two role. And I expect that to maintain for the remainder of the off season and into the season. And I think that bodes well for all parties. If something were to happen to Quinn Ewers, Malik Murphy has the experience advantage over Arch Manning and he's really talented in his own right. Right. I know Arch Manning is, you know, the prodigy number one player in his class, but Malik Murphy has an NFL level arm with NFL level size, right? So he's somebody that can come in and win football games for this Texas football team in his second year in the program. I think it bodes really well for Arch Manning that you can bring him along slowly and allow him to really just focus this year on development and not having to be in a position to go into games and win games for this Texas football team this year. And I think the same thing for the staff, right? Best case scenario is Arch Manning developing this year rather than him being put into the fire on the field. So I expect Malik Murphy to be quarterback two throughout the remainder of the spring, the offseason and heading into the season. And I'm really excited 
that at least in two games, hopefully <laughs> against Rice and Wyoming, we'll get to see Malik Murphy in his first game action this season. Move it to the running back room. This is a running back room that goes six deep <laughs> right now. Six players that I think all are really talented. And I said, you know, this room may not have the ceiling that it once had with B. John Robinson and Roshan Johnson, but it has a hell of a floor. I expect a lot from this running back room this year. And like I said, there are a lot of talented players that I don't know how you keep any of them off the field, but you're probably going to have to keep a few of them off the field. And I would say Jonathan Brooks is probably locked into that running back one spot, even though he hasn't participated much this spring. He's just shown too much on the field in a Texas jersey to play second fiddle to anybody that's behind him right now. Right. Averaging, I think, seven and a half yards a carry in his like 45 carries at the 40 acres. So he's been explosive. And I expect him to do that over the course of a full season this year. So then the conversation starts at running back two, right. Who would be the perfect complement to Jonathan Brooks? And I think the answer to that question is Jaden Blue and like I mentioned with quarterback, and I'll probably mention in every position group moving forward, experience is just king. We know that Cedric Baxter was the number one running back in the country. We know that, you know, Cedric Baxter is uber talented as a five star, right? But Jaden Blue has been on the Texas football team for two years. He's been in the system for two years. And I think he's the biggest home run hitter in this room. I think he's a bigger, better compliment to Jonathan Brooks than Cedric Baxter is. Also, we heard Steve Sarkeesian mention that you know Cedric Baxter started off slow in the last scrimmage but picked it up towards the end he's been on campus for three months so as talented as he is he's still a true freshman and that goes for Arch Manning Jonte Cook Malik you know Malik Muhammad the list goes on right so if you have two experienced players that you can put ahead of him I think that bodes well for Cedric Baxter and you can still find a way to get him into the rotation this year like you did last year with three running backs now I do not know what that means for Gosh, I don't know what that means for Keelan Robinson and Savion Red because I think they're both too talented to keep off the field this year. But I also don't know how you deploy five running backs. So it's going to be a very tough decision for Tashar Choice. It's going to be a very tough decision for Steve Sarkeesian. And they get paid a lot to make those tough decisions. But like I said, I think Jonathan Brooks is your number one running back. I think Jaden Blue as a home run hitter and having two years of experience works better with Jonathan Brooks as a compliment to him as running back too. And I think Cedric Baxter slides in as one of the most talented true freshman running backs in the country at running back three and somebody that you can still give, you know, a hundred touches to this year if you have the opportunity to. So I expect big things out of the running back room really from whoever get touches, even if it's Savion Red, but one, two, three, I think that looks like Jonathan Brooks, Jaden Blue, and then Cedric Baxter to start the season. When you talk about offensive line, I expected a lot more movement on the offensive line because coming into the offseason, I thought that Kelvin Banks was the only solidified starter on this offensive line. I knew that if Christian Jones came back and once he announced he was coming back, he would be a starter, but there was some conjecture about, okay, would he come back to right tackle or had Cam Williams shown enough in I guess a season in winter conditioning to move to right tackle and then Christian Jones moved to one of the guard positions right but we haven't seen any movement on the first team offensive line regardless of the reports about how talented the offensive line behind them has been we've heard great things about Peyton Kirkman even though there's no way he's taking over Kelvin Banks first team spot we've heard great things about Big Nito behind Hayden Connor we've heard great things about uh, Cam Williams, and we know what Cole Hudson can bring to the table. And the fact that all four of those players I just mentioned might be on your second team to start the season just speaks to the talent and the depth on this roster. But, you know, like I said, I expected some movement. I thought that, you know, Hayden Connor's job may be up for grabs at left guard. And as good as Big Nito has been, he hasn't been able to take the step in terms of taking over that number one spot over Hayden Connor. They said Big Nito has been really good, but Hayden Connor has been really good as well. And he has the experience to go with it. Jake Majors, I don't even know who Jake Majors is competing with. Do we still recruit players out of high school to play center? Like, I know obviously there's players in high school that play center, but when is the last time that Texas recruited a player and we were like, oh yeah, that's our center of the future, right? Like never, like I don't, even, I don't even know who Jake Majors is competing with. So I expect him to be out there in the Rice game, snapping the ball to Quinn Ewers. But then you have DJ Campbell at right guard. And I think that probably would have been your most intriguing battle if Cole Hudson came into the spring 100% healthy, right? But as we saw at the end of the season, that was the rotation. DJ Campbell was your number one right guard. And so we'll see if that maintains true throughout the remainder of the offseason. Then, of course, Christian Jones is at right tackle. Like I said, some people wanted to move him to guard and put Cam Williams at right tackle. But I'm a big believer in a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And I've watched for an entire season Christian Jones be a plus starter at right tackle. So 
if it was up to me, I'm putting Christian Jones back at right tackle and I'm figuring out three spots rather than four spots. So I think that's a testament to the first team offensive line that you have all that talent behind you. They're playing really well in spring practices thus far, but they haven't played well enough to kind of up in anybody on that first team. And as I said in my last episode, I think that'll bode really well for them going into the season if that remains to be your first team offensive line because that was the first team offensive line the entire offseason so that should bode really well for chemistry right on that offensive line and cohesion when we move to the defensive side of the ball on the defensive side on the defensive line we're talking about the edge position and baron sorrell is locked in to his edge position but there's been some conversation on the other edge position about Justice Finkley or Ethan Burke. And I think unfairly to both of these players, they've kind of been put in a box, right? Ethan Burke is the tall, long, you know, athletic player from Westlake who is profiled as a pass rusher, right? A really talented pass rusher. While Justice Finkley has been put into this box of, oh, he has short arms. So he's better as a high motor, you know, quick titchy run defender, right? Quick twitch run defender, right? And I don't think that's fair to either player because that insinuates that uh Ethan Burke can't stop the run and that insinuates that Justice Finkley can't rush the passer and I think they're both talented enough to do both and in most scenarios you would be looking for a clear starter at that position but I think it's a good thing that Bo Davis defensive line coach has said in the past we don't have starters on this defensive line like we expect everybody to come in and play like a starter and I think that would bode really well for Justice Finkley and Ethan Burke if they could play in a rotation at that position because I think they both bring really good football to this Texas football team instead of putting them in a box and then trying to decide which box is more important to this Texas football team. I think Ethan Burke and Justice Finkley both need to be on the field a lot for this defense to be really good for this Texas football team this year. When we move to the linebacker position, I was super bullish on Anthony Hill being a starter day one, right? And we should all be bullish on Anthony Hill, but I think it's a really good sign that David Benda has asserted himself in spring practices, right? He stepped right into that DeMarvian overshone role. He understood the assignment and he's held on to it thus far. And, you know, I would expect that to be, and even though Anthony Hill is really talented, I would expect that to remain throughout the off season and into the season. And that just goes, you know, all the credit in the world goes to David Mendez because it's hard to keep the number one linebacker in the country coming out of high school off the bench, right? Especially when David Bender doesn't have a, long track record of production at the 40 acres right that position was wide open coming into the season and i just assumed that anthony hill would take it over sooner than later but david bender has come in and performed really well even getting the you know honorable mention from steve sarkeesian in the press conference and all signs point to him being a starter in that demarvian overshone role when the season starts so um like i said it just speaks to the talent and the depth on this football team but experience is king and if you have a player in david bender that can come in with experience and ball for you on this Texas football team and be a plus starter that allows you to bring Anthony Hill along slower, right? Not just at the quarterback position does that benefit true freshmen sitting, but it benefits true freshmen, period, right? And if Anthony Hill and Leona LaFowle can be brought along slowly and maybe come in as death pieces or rotational pieces rather than being your starters and relying on them game in and game out to win big football games this year, I think that's best case scenario for everybody involved. So shout out to David Bender for holding off Anthony Hill because I thought it was only a matter of time before he took that spot and at least right now as i'm recording this episode david bender looks like your day one starter next to Jalen ford and then we want to talk about the corner position that's the last position battle i'm going to go into and we know that jade baron is locked in at that nickel position we know that ryan watts i always forget field or boundary so one of y'all will tell me in the comments but ryan watts is locked into one of those corner positions at the other corner position we have a really really good position battle going on right now gavin holmes and terrence brooks and the interesting thing is we've heard really good things about both of these players right i don't know how you keep either one off the field even though corner is in a position you traditionally rotate players at now we did last year for whatever reason right but i don't know if that would be the case this year but i also don't know how you keep gavin holmes if he doesn't win the starting job or terrence brooks if he doesn't win the starting job off the field this year i mean gavin holmes comes in with two years of starting acc experience and all the reports thus far have said that he's been really good right he's always around the ball he had an interception in the red zone in the last scrimmage and then they talked about terrence brooks just his professionalism the way he carries himself he's come in with they'd say the nfl type body like if the corners got off the bus first he would be the first one up the bus next to ryan watts he has really good size for the corner position and i thought he proved himself in relief of deshaun jameson last year that he can be a plus starter on this texas football team in his true sophomore year so a lot of talent a lot of depth on this football team all around 
especially at the positions I just mentioned. And this is a good problem to have, right? Your second team, all the players I just mentioned, could probably start for the majority of the teams in the country. And that's what you need, at least foundation-wise. You need that level of talent and depth on your roster to compete for conference championships and hopefully eventually national championships. A quick word from FanDuel when they're going to talk about Dylan DeSue. If he returns to this Texas basketball team next year, what does it mean for Rodney Terry and the roster? The NBA playoff, NBA playoffs are almost here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because new customers get a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet does not win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to points scored and threes made. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. It's a really important time for Texas basketball right now. It's a really important time for Rodney Terry, as we've talked about on this podcast. You're going through the process of – re-recruiting your current roster and then recruiting players in the transfer portal and we've seen a lot of players enter the transfer portal we've seen some movement thus far but the majority of the big name players and players that we've seen really produce at a high level over the last few years in college basketball are still in there but I think as Ronnie Terry has said right you have to figure out your staff and you have to figure out your current roster before you start going into the transfer portal saying hey I want you to play here right and one of the biggest pieces, maybe the biggest piece that you have to re-recruit on this roster to come back next year is Dylan DeSue. And we saw him emerge as a legitimate superstar towards the end of the season for Texas basketball. His last eight games, this is starting with the second Baylor game when we lost to Baylor and TCU back to back. But his last eight games, he averaged 16 and a half points and 7.3 rebounds for this Texas basketball team. You compare that to his season averages of six points and four rebounds. And that tells you that he really came on late 16 and a half points and 7.3 rebounds over the course of a whole season. You're talking about a first team, second team at worst, all big 12 performer. And I think if he comes back, he definitely is going to reach one of those metrics. And what I love the most about Dylan DeSue is the efficiency. When you look at the eight games, he shot 69% from the floor to put that in perspective, Zach Eady, who was seven foot four, who won national player of the year, who averaged 22 and 15, shot 61% from the floor at seven foot four. Now this is no knock to Zach Eady. I love Zach Eady. I think he gets unfairly criticized for being seven foot four and not winning a national championship every year. But I think it just speaks to Dylan DeSue, how talented of a scorer he is that he can shoot at a 70% clip over an eight game stretch when a seven, four player in the big 10 couldn't do that over the course of a season. And then when you talk about, what he was able to do in the NCAA tournament when he really started to make a name for himself, like we saw with other players, right? He was starting to do that, averaging 22 and 10 in the NCAA tournament in the two games he really played against Colgate and Penn State. He played against Xavier, but he played for a minute. So that would, you know, obviously affect his averages because he didn't score and had one rebound in that game. But you take that out, he had 22 and 10 in the two games he played in the NCAA tournament. So you looked at Dylan DeSue, what he was able to do at the end of the season, you know you were losing Marcus Carr, Timmy Allen, Serge Barry Rice, and Christian Bishop. And so you said, we need a legitimate scoring option to build around next year. I thought that without Dylan DeSue, this Texas basketball team could be really good next year. But I thought they would be like a gritty defensive team that could maybe score at times, right? We have some talented offensive players that scored a lot in high school, but they haven't proven they could do it at the college level. Maybe Tyrese Hunter, but it was inconsistent. Uh, at least in a Texas jersey, right? Dylan DeSue looks like the player that you can build around on the offensive side of the ball, right? We had a lot of pieces, but we didn't have a centerpiece. If Dylan DeSue comes back, he's the centerpiece. Everybody around him can fit in as pieces. And he just does so much on the offensive side of the ball, as we saw towards the end of the season. And, you know, you can make the argument that him not being there is the reason we lost to Miami. People have said on the defensive end, but I think the way that Miami was playing – he wouldn't have been in the paint like that and wouldn't have had a huge impact. But definitely on the offensive end, you could compare it to the end of the Penn State game where Penn State went on that run. But we had Dylan DeSue to calm everything down. When Miami went on that run, we had Timmy Allen in our three yards just crying, trying to frantic, frantically make plays at the end of the game. But they didn't have a Dylan DeSue that they could just dump the ball down to and say, hey, you're going to make 70 percent of your shots, calm our offense down and stop the run. Instead, we had inconsistent guard play at the end of the game. 
That's why Miami went to the Final Four, and we went home in the Elite Eight. But like I said, next season, Dylan DeSue brings so much to this Texas basketball team in terms of the offensive end, right? Because he can almost do everything as a big. When you talk about the pick and roll, right, he can roll to the basket and get easy buckets. He can also come off off the pick and pop and he can make the jump shot, whether it's the two or the three. We saw him make two or three threes against Baylor this year. Right. He can face up. You know, he can play with his back to the basket. He has a mid range shot. He has a three point shot. He has that floater with like point guard touch <laughs> he looks on that floater. And that's why he's shooting. 70 percent right in his last eight games and looked like one of the best players on this basketball team so he just does so much for you on the offensive end and like i said if he comes back next year he's unquestionably your offensive centerpiece and i think all the pieces you have around him in a ron holland a aj johnson a uh arterio morris a brock cunningham and hopefully uh a tyrese hunter fit around Dylan DeSue. But without Dylan DeSue, I don't think you have a centerpiece. I think you just have some really talented players on this team without a direction. I think with Dylan DeSue in the middle, you have a player you can play through on the offensive end. And then I think you have really talented offensive players and really gritty defenders around him. So this Texas basketball team needs Dylan DeSue, the hometown kid. And I think it's a really good sign for the basketball team that no announcement has been made yet because we saw Tyrese Hunter declare for the draft while maintaining college eligibility. The fact that Dylan DeSue has not done that yet shows me that he thinks he has unfinished business at the 40 acres. And really quickly, I want to get into the Texas baseball team. I mentioned that they had lost the weekend series after winning 16 straight games, including the first game against Oklahoma State. They lost the next two, losing that series, snapping the 16 game win streak in. Well, yeah, snapping the 16-game win streak and then losing the series against Oklahoma State. So then they faced off against Air Force, and it was a really fun game last year. We saw after the game where they kind of held hands um, and, and came together. It was a really inspiring moment. And I know every year this is a game that Air Force fans circle on their calendar and Texas fans circle on their calendar. It's just a really fun and respectful matchup, right, which you don't see a lot in college athletics. So it's just really heartwarming. But we had to put the beat into the Air Force, right? So we beat them up seven to one to get back in the win column. And now Texas baseball is 21 and nine on the season ahead of a weekend series uh, against Kansas State back in Big 12 conference play. And everything was hitting on all cylinders. You could say it was Air Force, but like I say, you have to play who was on your schedule. And they came out and they took care of business. The pitching staff was excellent. Only four hits and one run allowed. And all of those came from your starter. When you look at the bullpen, Five innings without allowing a hit to close the game. That is elite bullpen play. The bullpen has been really good this season. Like I said, it's been inconsistent. Sometimes it's the starters, then the bullpen is shaky. Sometimes the starters are shaky, and then the bullpen is lights out. Yesterday, the starter and the bullpen were lights out all game. Then on the offensive end, I told you they scored seven runs. Five of those coming via the home run. Three home runs yesterday from Powell, Campbell, and Galvan. So it's good to get back in the win column. Good to be 21 and nine on the season, heading into a weekend series against Kansas State. And I'm going to make the prediction that they win that series. I won't predict the sweep. I told you about the Rangers. I got to be humble when it comes to talking baseball, but I'm going to at least predict that they win two out of three games this weekend. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked on Longhorns, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hook them. Go Rangers. Go Astros. <laughs> in peace. <laughs>